if you want to have some more information on this, because I know some, a lot of people have to run to other presentations, have to meet people, we will publish information on all this later in the magazine. And we will record the speeches, so we will have them on the website. So don't worry, you will get the information. Thanks and welcome over here. First of all, thank you, Willy. And now I have to be exciting, right? So I'll try to do that. Um, as Willy was saying, this presentation was not possible five years ago because the company is five years old. Uh, but I guess I do subscribe to the position that there are good things happening in the aviation world. A lot of them have to do with electrification. And I think what we're trying to achieve together with a bunch of partners I'll talk about in a minute is one of the feasible things with today's technologies. And I would like to go over our project in the next uh, 30 minutes or so. But um, this is only interesting if you have any proper questions. So please feel free. And uh, we will have time for questions at the end. But if there is anything I'm saying that sounds like an DC that cannot happen in the near future, talk to us. This is the only thing my company does. Pretty simple, right? Aviation was founded back in 2015 to build a regional commuter. One plane that can take nine passengers, two crew, all electric for several reasons, but all electric first and foremost to solve the regional transportation problem. Now if we want to solve a regional problem, we need to show that there is one. Uh, and our philosophy basically claims that there is. Because if you want to travel anything between zero and 50 kilometers away, you have plenty of options. You can hop in your car, you can take a taxi, you can take Uber. If you live in a proper country, you can probably take a metro or a tram. You're in the city. If you're rich or if Uber Elevate or another VTOL happens relatively soon, you can fly a helicopter over traffic. But what happens if you want to go 500 kilometers away? Well, you have the Autobahn and you have IC. So if you took a high-speed rail, you probably did it from a major city center to a major city center. If you took the Autobahn, you were driving. And even if you took the Autobahn fast, which is unique for this area of the world, and even if it was in an autonomous car, the limitations of the speed you can really take are significant. Not everywhere is an Autobahn. Not everywhere can have this uh, infrastructure. And one of the dreams that was out there from the very beginning of flight, if you think about it, 1950s, plenty of pilots come back from the war, and the Americans build a bunch of airstrips. Why? Because everybody's gonna buy a Cessna and fly everywhere, right? Well, wrong. The people in this room, the people in this conference, are aviation people, they like it. But most people don't use general aviation as transportation, for all sorts of reasons. It's not fun to fly in, it's bumpy. But more importantly, it's damn expensive to operate an aircraft and it's very expensive to be a pilot over time. And we believe, and I think this is one of the biggest motivations of this industry and one of the big differentiators of what could make this industry go electric in a more aggressive way than the auto industry is. The big differentiator is that this, this makes economic sense right now. This is not maybe yeah you'll pay more for the plane and you pay more for maintenance and then no if you build it the first and most significant factor that changes is the cost of direct operating the cost of flying that plane for one hour this is why we designed this plane that size because it takes you anywhere between as short as you want to a thousand kilometers away on a charge that means a very, very big battery. Very, very big battery cannot have a four-seater on top of it. It needs to be that size. And that's the biggest plane you can operate with single pilot operation under charter or part 135 operation in the US if you're there. What does it do to the operator? So let's assume you have your Cessna 402, Cessna Caravan, your Beechcraft B200, your Pilatus BC-12, all of those great machines that are out there today that were designed sometime around the 50s or 60s at best, 
and were certified and got to work and are doing a very good job today. If you're operating one of those machines, you'll probably know that your direct operating cost is anywhere between five or six hundred dollars a flight hour, not including pilot, not including insurance, not including anything but the energy, the reserves for motors, and the maintenance reserves. If this is what you're paying, you're probably operating a piston. And if you're paying closer to a thousand dollars or maybe twelve or even fourteen hundred, you're probably operating a turboprop or a double turboprop, a twin. The difference in reality of going electric pushes the direct operating cost to roughly two to three hundred dollars a flight hour. We claim two hundred for one reason. Making the system electric makes it cheaper to operate. Why? Well, now three reasons. A, energy. The cost of energy at the end game derives from the cost of oil if you're operating an oil drinking aircraft. But a single kilogram of thrust that started its life as 100 cc's of fuel or as a kilowatt hour in the socket is roughly eight times cheaper. Now that's because of two things. First of all, the actual cost of energy. Secondly, because of the efficiency of the system. If you're operating a PT6, you're throwing a lot of energy's worth of oil into a system that gives you roughly 30% of that energy back as thrust at best. That means you're cooling a lot. Electrical systems made by the likes of Siemens and other uh, motor operators, sorry, motor manufacturers are efficient to roughly 90, 92, 95%. That's a big difference right there. Another aspect that's extremely significant has to do with the fact that we have one moving part in each of these motors and no part is at 900 degrees Celsius or anything close to that. That means maintenance is simpler. Those machines are simpler to maintain. It's intuitive. We know this because of electric cars. We know this because we saw, well, some cars stuck beside the road. We haven't seen too many refrigerators stuck beside the kitchen, right? Those machines work. They work because they're simple. They work because they're designed to work tens of thousands of hours between faults. And this is by design. So if you make them maintainable, the need to be really take them apart, overhaul them, take care of them every 3,600 hours, drops. And that means the cost of operating them drops as well. These are the two main factors that make this direct operating cost dramatically lower. Now, if you put this in an efficient machine, an efficient machine meaning a machine that really takes full advantage of the potential advantages of electric propulsion, for example, where's the in intake? Where's the radiator on this? Well, there isn't one, not because we forgot to put it there. There isn't one because it's 95% efficient. So there isn't too much to cool. So we don't have any cooling drag. So a plane like this can fly longer, better, than anything else out there, but it has the energy density problem of the battery, right? That's the story. Still, let's assume for a second, give me the benefit of the doubt, I'll give you some more data in a second. But let's assume for a second we solve that. What do we give the operator? We give him savings of anywhere between 400,000 to 1.2 million dollars a year, assuming he is a regular operator, not pilot owned, but a charter or on-demand operator flying kind of air tax emissions, flying roughly 1,000 to 1,500 hours a year. Just a normal regional operator would save that much. That's insane, how much is a plane, right? Well, the plane is anywhere between three and a half and four million dollars. So the ROI is roughly three years, four years. When you buy these machines for 20 years, you're doing pretty, pretty well here. What else we do? We make it sustainable. Excuse me for a second for jumping a few pointers, but I want to make the sustainable point here a reality for a second. Sustainable usually relates to, okay, carbon emissions, lead pollution, stuff like that, right? I want to take a broader view of sustainable in the sense that building electric can make an aircraft a part of transportation, an aircraft like this, a general aviation aircraft, a part of the transportation fabric again, because it's sustainable in, in three forms that are very, very significant to the way we treat ourselves as a society. One, it makes economic sense. It's cheap enough. It needs to be economically sustainable. 
it cannot be a toy for the rich. If you think about it for a second, a hundred and something years ago, if you were super rich, you had a driver, you had white gloves, and you had an automobile, right? You, you had something that moves autonomously without a horse. If you're super rich today, you have a driver, he has black gloves, and he takes you on your G650. The real shift doesn't happen because someone developed a machine that someone, somewhere, might be able to afford. The real shift is because of Ford and Benz making it affordable. That's the difference. That's sustainable. So first, it needs to make economic sense. $200 of direct operating cost at 240 knots, nine passengers, that makes sense, that can work. Second, it needs to make, it can, sorry, it needs to make sense in terms of operations. It needs to be sustainable in the sense that I would like to live next to an airfield that operates those so I can grab Uber, take a 10, 20, 15 minute drive, climb onto a plane like this without TSA standing in line, taking my shoes off, putting them back on. No, not a billion dollar facility, a small facility. It needs to be close to population, so it needs to be, it needs to be quiet. Well, guess what? Electric propulsors allow us to make planes much, much, much more quiet. Why is that? Everybody, I'm guessing plenty of pilots in the audience, the, the noise comes from the prop, right? Well, right. But the prop makes noise because we optimize for this power curve. We optimize for the maximum torque, for the efficiency of the motor. So we have to spin at the specific RPM, and this is why the tip speed has to be high. If we get to be efficient in a broader band of torques, we can select a different RPM for this prop, and we don't get that of the motor if it is a piston. So you can get quieter. It's not silent. It's not like driving your electric car at 10 kilometers an hour. It's a big machine. It needs a lot of power. But you can spin the props at the lower RPM and make it quieter. So the social acceptance, the environment around us should be more sustainable. We should be able to operate closer to people. The third is the tree hug hugging aspect of this, of this project. Yes, it is lead free, we're talking about 100 LL, low lead, right? Well, we should be no lead for the last century, probably. It's the only lead pollutant practically out there distributed this way. It is important to emit less. It is important to have zero CO2, CO2 footprint at the tailpipe, as they call it. And then you start answering questions of where the power comes from and so on and so forth. We will, but the point is, you need to be sustainable in all aspects for this to really work. That's the plane. Nine passengers, 650 miles. That's 1,000 kilometers on a charge, 240 knots, 450 kilometers per hour. That's what this plane can do with today's technology. All composite, weird design, a bit drone-like, but that's to be slick and to be able to really deliver on the numbers because we want very, very high efficiency at cruise. The plane is um, a place for, let's call it. You know what, I'll, I'll give you the other angle of this. The plane maximum takeoff weight, the Alice's maximum takeoff weight is 6.35 tons. It's a big plane. Out of it, 3.6 tons is battery. So internally we joke that it's a battery with some plane painted on it. But that's more or less the story. This is a huge lithium ion battery. Today's technology as you know it in the auto industry. Better cool, better safety, better some stuff, but that's about it. Three motors made by Siemens, three propellers. And the reason we have those three is not only because, well, you don't really pay a penalty for distributing electric propulsion, but it's also because this gives you a very unique set of features that you couldn't get anywhere else. Putting a wingtip propulsor, a propeller at the end of a wingtip, it's not our idea. NASA wrote amazing articles about it in the 80s. But if you have a motor that shakes and vibrates and breathes air, you're going to have a huge nacelle out there. It's going to, every benefit you're going to get in reducing induced drag and in doing good things for crews is going to really go back on structure. But what if it's electric? It doesn't vibrate. 
way lighter. Yeah, the battery is heavy, but that's the battery. We decoupled something from something, right? You can put the battery somewhere, you can throw the energy where you want it, you don't need to breathe air anymore, so you don't need to make drag at that area, and you do not vibrate as much. So, suddenly, wingtip propulsors are possible. Why are they good for? Well, as I said, induced drag goes really, takes a nosedive, not literally. And the other side of this is the ability to look at this whole thing as a system and to understand that once you have electric controls, you can command them at different frequencies, different rates. For example, we listen to our sensors roughly 400 times a second. We make fly-by-wire decisions 100 times a second. That means that all the time, the throttle that the pilot decided where it should be, he asked for 70% power, no problem. So he gets some power from each one of those motors based on the position the plane should be in. If there is some turbulence and one side wants to go faster, the system will correct it 100 times a second. That means that no one feels nothing ever. Now, the thing is, you need to augment that with flight control surfaces, right? So you want to be able to move your ailerons, you want to be able to move your rudder vaders, because we have this funny detail, and you want to be able maybe even to use flaps, or at least use your ailerons as flaperons, in a rate that is also in that area, so you'll be relevant. And suddenly you have something that was unheard of in general aviation before, that's augmented stability. You feel turbulence, and you can react to it way faster than a pilot could. This is only possible with a propulsion system that reacts at this speed. This is only possible if you have electric actuation all around, if you have the right computers all around. So this is what we've built. We have designed this plane from the ground up to be electric, because if it's a conversion, you're going to have that cooling drag. You're going to have those features not possible. You're not going to have the capability to do this system of systems and gain the rewards. We've built it quite comfortable because we want people in the 21st century to feel that they're walking into a 21st century transportation means and sit comfortably in a plane. This is the interior of this is roughly the size of the Beechcraft B350. So the end of the category, the price is not even close. We've been doing this with quite a few partners globally. Siemens is represented here very heavily, and we are very proud of this cooperation with them and their uh, development of inverters and motors. Honeywell was the front runner for our uh, fly-by-wire development. They did their own set of computers for us, and today, in the size of what's roughly six iPhones, we have the computational power that was really unheard of not ten, ten years ago. So amazing computational power, very safe and very redundant that's packed into smaller packages, not something you put in a 787, something you can put in general aviation uh, machines, and you can price for general aviation machines. The Fraunhofer Institute has been very instrumental in the uh, construction of uh, composite parts. I'm gonna run to the very interesting part. So, Kokum is making uh, one iteration of our battery cells. We actually have uh, several suppliers by now, but Kokum did the original cell, it's ours. We love it very much. Uh, we have Carboman here in France that's doing, uh, that's doing parts of the fuselage as well. But I want to kind of linger for a second on Hartzell over there. Hartzell propellers, it looks like a very old logo, right? Well, guess why? It's very old. Uh, these guys have been making the propellers for the Wright brothers. So it's been a while and they know what they're doing. I'm uh, very proud that they have developed a five-blade low tip speed propeller for us because we wanted to get the propulsive efficiencies at the low RPMs that today's turboprops don't really live in that area. We had to build a lot of stuff ourselves as well. You can see on the top left, this is a half fuselage. I'll show you some more complete pictures in a second. The seats look nice. These are the Honeywell computers on the bottom right I was talking to you about. And these are the uh, actuators. At the end game, you want servos that are all electric, that could be certified, that have the redundancy, that respond to the bandwidth you wanted, that can move the radians per second you wanted. There are no such servos in the market, so we had to build them. So there is a small facility in Israel that's making those. This is 10 days 
Will this work? Yes, it will. Okay, so 10 days in a hangar, not far from the La Bourget Airport. You can imagine why. Come see it in 60 days. Um, it's very, very labor intensive. This is February. We actually painted, moved, changed. This is the fuselage in France. This is a piece of the wing. Actually in Singapore, it's now in a container en route to France. This plane is being integrated as we speak. And this is not some mock-up maybe one day. We've built and crashed and flown enough prototypes at different scales. This is the full-scale, fully functional, conformal aircraft that will be certified eventually. We will present it at the next Paris Air Show. This is what it will look like. Yes, it has a tail wheel. Sorry, we had to. Um, this is what it will look like. And as I said, June 17 to June 23rd this year, not 2020 something, in Paris. So it's coming sooner than you think. Some other upcoming milestones. Uh, we've had a very, very long run with uh, the FAA around the certification of this aircraft, and we expect it to be even longer. Uh, certifying this plane is very difficult for several reasons. Uh, first of all, it's the first general aviation aircraft that's all fly by wire, no backups, no clutches, no nothing. There is no physical connection between the stick and the throttle and anything. And the other aspect is, of course, the small thing of this being an all electric. So, huge battery. There is a clear path to certifying this, maybe unlike a lot of the other projects out there today. This is not, this doesn't fall like a stone once power is out. It glides like a plane. It behaves like a plane. It's a Part 23 or CS 23 aircraft through and through. It did help a lot that there was a rewrite for Part 23 back in 2017. It's the only way to really get electric propulsion there, not as an exception but it was accepted both in the US and in Europe, so our path to certification is not easy. It's very clear, and through and with our partners, I think we can get there by the end of 2021. That means we're gonna see not just the flight, but the ability to uh, buy tickets sometimes in 2022. That's a reasonable time frame. Could I be one year wrong? Yes. Could I be five years wrong? I don't think so. That's the difference, I think, between anyone who's building an electric aircraft that looks and behaves like an aircraft in today's regulatory environment that's possible in today's regulatory framework to any project that's looking elsewhere. Um, this uh, small talk was uh, titled The Flight of the Alice, so I'm sorry, but we're going to have to wait a bit for that. Uh, we are, as I said, integrating the, full, the first, first, first scale right now. Uh, systems are a go, the Ironbird works fine, and the previous models were, uh, well, most of them worked fine. And uh, we expect to see this flying sometime before the end of the year. So this plane is actually going to go to, uh, to Paris to be presented, and then it gets packed up and sent off to a test facility in the U.S. And will fly there before the end of this year. That's a story. Thank you very much, and if you have any questions, that would be the time. Thanks, have a great day.